Today's subject, the forgotten classic of classical liberalism, Volney's The Ruins of Empires. Welcome to Locofoco number eight, The Ruins of Empires. My name is Timothy Verkula. You can find me on the web at, at workman and workman.com and at locofoco.us and locofoco.net. Today I've invited Thomas Christian Williams, the author of English Turn, to explain to us the importance of Volney's book and the part that Volney played in French and American history. But we're living through a historical time right now with the shutdowns, and Christian lives in France. So I couldn't help but start by asking him what's going on in France. Uh, the lockdown is set to come to an end on May the 11th. And the French have been amazingly uh, pretty observant and pretty patient. There, uh, there's a lot of fear that has gone into that patience. And uh, so uh, now, you know, the past couple of weeks, things have been have been improving in the terms of the number of people that are in intensive care. That that line has been going down for a couple of weeks, and they're saying this week there's going to be a big, big drop this week, next week. And into May 11, so everybody's ready for it to be over too. I think I don't, they're they're not going to do another lockdown like this. I think I think that's pretty clear that they just they're going to accept some deaths, and uh, they're gonna they're gonna say you know we're going to do social distancing, we're gonna going to do masks for everybody, and we're going to expand the testing. And and. And what they did not do, and they didn't do this in the U.S. either, and they did it in China, and it worked really well, was um, they if you they gave tests, and if you came down with a test, if you had the fever, you did not go home. You went to a COVID center, and you stayed there until you were healed, right? And so if you don't go home, you don't go back to your business, you can't spread it. And so I think they're they're moving toward that model here, and they're, they're, it takes it takes a while to set up. You know, the Asian countries had SARS and MERS a while back in the early 2000s, and so they got a little bit of experience and on the West in that particular regard. And so they they've kind of they've figured out how to do this. We're going to be sorting through a lot of information for the next several months and years about what the various methods have been and how they've worked and, you know. Yes. When we go off the lockdowns, people are going to be a little freaked when the number of infections go up. But that's to be expected. That's, yep, it's going gonna, gonna to happen. And, it's, and, that's, and that in itself, I know a lot of people who are just freaked at any mention of more infections. I mean, we have to, we have to ride this thing out all the way, and we can't because there's one obvious reason. We produce, and when we stop producing, as we've done, there's nothing left to buy. You can get all the checks from the government you want, but if there are no goods in the market, uh, this is going to be a big problem if they don't. I mean, we really have to stop soon, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's you know, they got caught off sides in the West on this one. And they weren't quite as ready. They didn't have the experience. But now I think they're, they're gearing up some parts of the economy to produce all the masks, to produce the tests, to get to working on the vaccine. To, to doing the ventilator thing. So this time when the second wave, third wave comes along, I mean, the vaccine's not going to be till mid next year at the earliest, but uh, I think on some of the mechanical type stuff, they'll have a little bit better preparedness for when the second, third waves come along. But then even vaccine is not a cure. And vaccine, we have flu vaccines every year and we still have flus every year with tens of thousands of deaths every year. So I think yep. we should... I think people should be a little realistic about everything. Um, I think that's that's the way it's going to go. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to the new world. Yeah. Which is remarkably like the old world, since, like I said, I was reading Mary Shelley's The Last Man, in which everybody dies except one man <laughs> from, a, wow. uh, from a pestilence. That's the story, that she, the last novel. Well, Brian Aldous talked about uh, how he was pretty certain that Vernet, his, her hero, was based on Volney. And he... Yeah. And the fact that she was interested in Volney previously in her in her first novel, and then also the very idea of ruins as somehow affecting the future, I mean, that's just sort of there in science fiction, but it's also there in Volney in a poetic way. So maybe you should explain a little bit what the, what the ruins of empires uh, looks like. Sure. Well, it's, uh, it's set in the ruins of Palmyra, Syria. 
And so there's a lone philosopher who's traveling through the ruins and he goes to a hillside overlooking the ruins of Palmyra and he says, you know, how can it be in this vast desert that there could be once this beautiful city? And so he just starts this contemplation inside of himself and this when this genie appears. And the genie represents the voice of reason. And so the two of them together come up with a formula that explains the rise and fall of empires. And according to Volney, empires rise if government allows enlightened self-interest to flourish. That's the magic formula that applies to all countries, all cultures, all continents, all centuries. And that's the reason Thomas Jefferson liked it. He was saying, this is what we're trying to do here in the U.S. This is what uh, the, the Enlightenment-based principles upon which this country is founded. The American people need to be introduced to this book because it will help counterbalance the influence of some of the, the church. And so uh, Volney wrote this in France. Is that correct? Yes. And it yes. is in French. And then there were a series of translations, at least three, if I remember right. Is that correct? Uh, in English, yes. In English, so yeah. Yeah, there's, there, was a, there are a couple of British English translations that made their way to the U.S. And uh, when Volney got there, uh, he visited the U.S. 1795 to 98 during the Adams administration, okay? And Jefferson, he was of a different party. He was vice president under John Adams. But at that time, the Constitution allowed a president and a vice president of different parties. You can't do that anymore, but at the time you could. So Jefferson, he was out of favor. He was not in the cabinet. He spent most of his time on top of the hill there in Monticello. And that was when he was rebuilding what we now classically know and call Monticello. It was being rebuilt at that time when he was vice president. Volney shows up. They knew each other back in France during the revolution. In fact, it was Benjamin Franklin that introduced them, right? So when Volney gets to the U.S., he already knows Jefferson. Everybody knows who Volney was. He was one of those guys who's like his reputation preceded him. And he was one of those people that people either loved him or they hated him. There was very little middle ground. And this book that we're going to be talking about tonight, Ruins of Empires, was a big part of that reputation that preceded him. And so thus, thus the Volney story in the U.S. begins. Okay, and some Americans had read the book because sure. because it was translated in Great Britain. So it was when, when, in British English, right? Right, and, right. and when Volney arrived in America, he was a known quantity. As he was said. a known quantity. Everybody knew him, and so I, it was like the Federalists and Adams side. They really detested him personally. But France also. The, the strange thing was about this time, 1795. You know, the the U.S. Uh, Republic got started in 1789 with our Constitution being approved. And, you know, we, we think of Americans in 1776, but that's just the revolution. It wasn't the Constitution, right? right. So 89, the Constitution is what was approved, goes into force. And in France, it's just about that same time period that the revolution gets going. Volney was in that very first National Assembly that threw out the king, that threw out the aristocracy, that threw out the clergy, and he sat on the committee that wrote the very first French Constitution. In fact, he was writing, one hand, the French Constitution at the exact same moment that he was writing the last draft of Ruins of Empires. So he was holding in his hands at that moment these two things. The real reality that he had to write that French constitution was kind of a compromised document because the king was still there, the aristocracy was still there, the church still had, but he had his own theory that he wanted to implement in the ruins. And that was what was, it, it was, it was the, the juggling act he was doing at that time. So, yes, what, what was your original question? I'm very curious about what Americans thought of Volney and what Volney thought of Americans. And okay. What... Okay. What, what did he, what did he think of America in the ruins? What he wants is a Republican style constitution. That's with a small R Republican. That is uh, separation of church and state democracy. Uh, let's say uh, limited government, 
three branches of government with balance powers between them so that they counterbalance each no one and takes over uh, universal suffrage. So that was what he was looking for, for uh, the American, well, for any republic, right? And that was what he wanted for France. But as we know in history, the, the British kind of interfered in the French Revolution and financed a lot of the counter-revolutionary uh, uh, domestic opposition to the French Revolution. And the British also financed all the armies of all the other kingdoms surrounding France. And so there was a lot of pressure put on France from the outside that gave more power to that domestic counter-revolutionary movement. And that's why eventually when Volney came to the US in 1795, he was saying, it's not going to be my country, France, that is going to be the big model for the world. It's going to be the United States. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to come to the US. At about that time, uh, France was starting to experiment with the Assignat, right? It was about that time when the, when the, the uh, Assignat came in, and that was a real yeah. huge, that was a huge corrupting influence on the revolution. I, I think that that was, that to me was the moment where the French Revolution started going sour. You're, you're talking about just the, the, uh, the, the new monetary coin of the realm quickly collapsed. It was, it was right? a disaster from the yeah. Very quickly, yeah. and, and it got it got worse and worse over time. And it's it's a very complicated thing. I've written about it elsewhere, but it's an interesting problem. But so Volney goes to America, and at that time, I think that there's something called the quasi war with France. Yes, on. yeah. So uh, good good point. So uh, Volney arrives in the U.S. 1795, and the U.S. has been a neutral power in this long running struggle between England and France. And right now there's a blockade of all British goods trying to get into the continent. So the U.S. as a neutral third power is actually shipping British goods back and forth between England and the continent and cleaning up quite well in the process of doing this. So what the French government did was they gave letters of mark to French privateers saying, we will give you money if you go out and capture American shipping. American merchant marines, American cargo vessels with all this British cargo on board. And that's what started happening was all these British privateers, pri pirates in another word, right. they would go out and they would seize the American boats, the American crews and, and the goods that were on those boats. And so this was obviously making the, the let's say the money classes on the U.S. East Coast, Boston, New York, Baltimore, all those folks, they were getting up in arms about this. And of course, John Adams was very federalist. He was very in favor of, uh, let's say, getting hard with France about this issue. And so that was the quasi war was there was this increasingly hostile environment between the two once sister republics that began more or less at the same time in history, but now because of this quasi war, this seizing of American vessels on the high seas, the, the relations between the two countries were no longer quite what you thought they would be. Plus the Federalists, they were just, they were royalists anyway. They wanted to be more aligned with the British than they did with France. And of course, as we all know, Jefferson preferred to be aligned with France. Did Volney, was he a, thought of as a spy even? How negative was he viewed by the Federalists? Pretty negative. Okay, yes, he was considered to be a spy. And then, of course, there was the Federalist Press who was looking at his book, The Ruins, and there's quite a lot of, uh, f let's say, phrases such as man created God in his, in his own image, not the reverse, which could be interpreted as atheist or anti-Christian or anti-religion. Right. So Volney was already had the Federalists both in government and in the press pretty much against him. And so at this point, it's it, it's going to be a, a difficult place for Volney to stay. He was wanting to stay in the U.S. The spy thing, for example, it was probably true. He was spying for the French government. But what John Adams never understood 
was that the reports that Volney was sending back to his friends in the directory, the, the directory was the name of the French government at that time, the reports that he was sending back were actually favorable to the U.S. position. He was sending back reports helping the directory to understand the mistakes they were making with the Americans. He, he said at one point, you know, having been here a few months now, I've come to understand there's not a whole lot of Americans who have a big love for their president, John Adams, because he's just a cranky old man. But there are a lot of Americans who have a big love for their constitution. And the mistakes that you're making is that you are, in, in essence, you're, you're hurting American pride, you're hurting their pride in their constitution for their, their union government that they've created, and that's the mistake you're making. And this is an example of the kind of spying he was doing. Um, he was sending back these reports that were actually favorable to the U.S. position. I'm interested to know when Volney left, was it because there was a brewing anti-Volney campaign? Uh, was it because of the Alien and Sedition Acts? How did he relate to the Alien and Sedition Acts? Yes and yes. It was, it was directly, specifically at him. His, he was the most famous Frenchman in the U.S. at that time. Okay, So his name was specifically mentioned in Congress during the debate over the Alien Act. And Jefferson said in a letter that I've read between Jefferson and Madison that Volney was specifically being targeted as a spy by the Alien Act. So, you know, he cut out, he cut out, he was here for three years in the U.S. for three years, 1795 to 98, and he left right before the Alien Act went into effect. And when, so, what year was the Alien Act going into effect? When was it? When was it enacted? Uh, when it go to effect? I forget exactly. Uh, it's. I guess it's more or less the same time. And he was gone in ninety eight, seventeen ninety eight. So I guess it's about that same time, and within and, months. You know. And uh, meanwhile, in reaction to the Alien and Sedition Acts, Madison and Jefferson cooked up the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which mm -hmm. were very important documents and and would shock most Americans. And in fact, even Dumas Malone. The, the uh, uh, the first major biographer of our time of Jefferson refers to the Kentucky resolutions as treasonous, uh, wow. which I was just I was astounded. I don't consider them treasonous at all. I consider them a pretty good explication of the Constitution, but uh, to him they were treasonous. Uh, sure. And uh, and Jefferson was, and that's when the Democratic Republican clubs were being made up about that time too, right? Yeah, yeah. And the opposition to the Federalists was growing. And Thomas right. Jefferson was leading it. Right. And meanwhile, he was doing something else regarding Volney. Yes, okay, exactly. Um, at the same time, uh, Jefferson and Volney got together at Monticello. Volney was visiting there. He was on his way taking a hike uh, from Philadelphia, the capital, where he stayed most of the time when he was in the U.S., he went to Washington, D.C., which was then under construction. Then he visits Washington at Mount Vernon. And then he goes on and he visits Volney at Monticello. And then he's going to be going over the Appalachian Range, down the Ohio. And he was supposed to go into New Orleans as part. And this is also part of the French spying thing about Volney. He was going to go down and check out Louisiana Territory, which was then under Spanish control. And the French government was looking into whether or not, you know, France can reacquire Louisiana from Spain. And so this was part of the suspicion about Volney. So anyway, Volney visits uh, Jefferson at Monticello. And it was then that the two men conceived this idea that Jefferson would translate Volney's ruins of empires into modern American English because Volney was speaking a good enough lick of English by this point that he understood this British English thing. It's just, it, 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 it's not well written, number one. It's got, it's too flourishing. It's, it, it tries to be too complex, too poetic. And it's just, it, it covers up what's really being said. And it was this old kind of British English language. So Jefferson says, I want to translate your book because this is the book your thing, your political science thing about empires rise if government allows enlightened self-interest to flourish 
And we can talk about what enlightened self-interest is defined as later, but this is what we're trying to do here in the U.S. This is what I want to explain to the American people. So it was there at Monticello that the two men came up with that idea. And later, when Volney returned from his little jaunt, he, he ended up not going to Louisiana. He came back to, uh, to civilization via the Great Lakes and dropped down through New York City, down the Hudson to New York City. In New York, he dined with John Jay and Alexander Hamilton. This is another example of how everybody at that time knew who this guy was. They were receiving him. Even if they had differences with him, he was someone to be received, right? So uh, this, this whole conspiracy between Jefferson and Volney began at that 17, spring of 1796, Volney's visit to Monticello. Very good. And I wanted to just put an asterisk in here for our uh, viewers, because this is about the time where you make a little change in history for your novel. Is that correct? You, you... Yes. Yeah. So you yeah. have a novel. You better explain your novel before we get too far. OK, yeah. Well, what the, the novel thing came about because uh, in the modern day, Jacques Chirac, the former president of France, like 1995, 96, he tried to outlaw use of the English language in France. And I was, I was just, I was appalled by this whole thing. I had never heard of, Je of Volney. I'd never heard of Jefferson's involvement with the book. But President Chirac trying to outlaw the use of the English language in France, it just, it incensed me to the point where I said, you know, Jack, it's a little bit too late. I was just talking to myself, right? And I just said, Jack, you know, it's a little bit too late to be trying to do that. If you, if you really wanted to stop the rise of the English language influence on the planet, Bonaparte should not have sold Louisiana to Thomas Jefferson. Bonaparte should have gotten on a boat, sailed to New Orleans, planted the French flag at the mouth of the Mississippi River and claimed that whole thing that we Americans know as Louisiana territory for the glory of the French Republic. And I thought that thought, and then I thought, Jesus, that's a great idea for a novel. <laughs> and so then I started researching it. I came across Volney. I came across his uh, ruins of empires. I came across Jefferson liked it so much, he translated it. So I wrote all this thing into my book. And, it cha and the, the, the change of history that I do in my book, English Turn, Napoleon Invades Louisiana. It's available at Amazon.com. It's volume one. Uh, is that Bonaparte does exactly that. He gets on the boat. He sails to New Orleans. And it's all because there's been this argument about Jefferson's... What happens is uh, Bonaparte discovers that Jefferson has translated this heretical book. And he's incensed that, that, Jeff, that Volney has gone off in advance to Louisiana to found a true French Republic, keeping the using the British Navy as a block between Bonaparte, who's stuck in France, and here's Volney in Louisiana trying to carve out just a small little French Republic. He's going to give the rest of Louisiana to the U.S. And he's just going to keep a little piece for France like a Singapore kind of a thing, a really prosperous, dynamic, dem democratic-oriented type government, and let the U.S. go ahead and have the rest of those, you know, those lands up to the north, but just around New Orleans, right? That, that Franco, that where all the French speakers are, that's Volney's idea, and that's what really gets Bonaparte worked up. And I won't go into the details of it, but eventually Bonaparte does come to New Orleans and that's the book. I, I wanted to put that in there because, of course, that is your book on the subject, so that's important for our talk and for our readers who might want to look it up because it's you know it's going to be fun. Uh, the first chapter is very good, but I want to go back to the history a little bit, even further than we went, because sure. didn't, at some point Volney has an important relationship with uh, Bonaparte. Doesn't he discover Bonaparte? Bonaparte, yeah. Volney is the guy who discovers... Napoleon Bonaparte on the island of Corsica, 1793. Volney is already a famous traveler, philosopher, pamphleteer, revolutionary. That he was in that very first National Assembly. He was well known, and so he shows up on the island of Corsica because he wants to buy in the southern part of the island a big uh, farm 
so that they could try, the French could try growing sugarcane there where it's warm. And the reason was France had lost all of its colonies in the Antilles, like uh, Saint-Domingue, what's now known as Haiti, because of the, the slave revolution, the slave revolt that was happening there. So Volney's idea was to go down to Corsica and buy some land, try and grow sugarcane. Well, when he arrives, this little corporal in the local militia starts following him around like a puppy dog saying, oh, Mr. Volney, you know, oh, you, you want to go? I know this. I know where the best land is. I know all the people you should meet, blah, blah, blah. That corporal in the local militia was Napoleon Bonaparte. And so in years after, uh, Volney helps Bonaparte's career at several strategic moments. And after he participates, Volney participates after he leaves the U.S., he goes back to France, he participates in the coup that brings Bonaparte to power. Bonaparte even asks him to be the third consul, and he turns that down. He asks him to be the interior minister, which is like being the, the chief of the national police in France. Well, he turns that down, but he became a senator under Bonaparte. And then when Bonaparte uh, did the thing about... Uh, crowning himself as as the emperor of france emperor of the french bonaparte was the only uh, was one of only three senators to vote against you mean volney, volney was volney was the uh, only senator he was he was he was one of only three senators to vote against the proclamation of the empire okay so even though he's the guy who discovered bonaparte and helped bonaparte when it came time for bonaparte to become napoleon to destroy everything that Volney had worked for, the French Republican-style government, constitutional government, that's when the two men went their separate ways. And I really like this part of the story, partly because I've been a big fan of the Stute de Tracy for quite a long time. And yeah. the Stute de Tracy was one of the people who basically uh, signed out Napoleon for the last time as emperor of, of France. Uh, he has an interesting history regarding to that. Uh, he, he, was, he, was, he wrote the document Basically, that was that basically booted uh, Napoleon away. Uh, but I'm curious, what was Volney's relationship with the ideologues? And at some point, Bonaparte turned on the ideologues. Yes, well, uh, Tracy was the guy who invented the word ideology, which only means the science or the study of ideas. And these were all, um, let's say, politician philosophers that were at the Institute, the Academie Francaise. Volney was one, Tracy was another. J.B. Say is a famous free market economist that was as well known in his day as Adam Smith, and they both supported more or less the same uh, economic policies. The ideologues all supported uh, constitutional government on the American model. No king, no queen, separation of church, church and state, free trade. Right. So all these these ideologues were all the leading thinkers, leading edge, even thinkers of their day. And at first they supported Bonaparte's coup led by Volney, who knew Vo Bo Bonaparte the best. Volney said, this is our guy. This is our guy who's going to be the George Washington of France, because when F George Washington was the general who beat off all of the, the British Empire, and then when they offered him the crown, he declined, right? And so Volney is saying, this is going to be our general. This is going to be our general Washington. He's going to follow the Washington example. And of course, Bonaparte does just the opposite. He picks up the crown himself, as we all know from that famous painting by David, and puts it on his head there in Notre Dame. So that was when Bonaparte and the ideologues broke. But when, when you look at the word ideologue, it just means the science or the study of ideas, but it has a totally different meaning in the modern day. It's got that negative pejorative, and that comes from Bonaparte because when they split, it was Bonaparte, he could not argue with them logically because their, their arguments were so well rationally, logically constructed that he could only turn to ad hominy type attacks. And yeah, he was saying, whoa, Sorry for the French, but it yeah. just means these 
these uh, how how can I translate this for a G audience or or do I have an R audience? You have an R audience for this one. Okay, I well what that that would be these fucking a ideologues are bugging the hell out of me. Very good. And and so that's that was the beginning of their split between. And so Bonaparte was using this pejorative, and a generation or so later. There was this German philosopher reading into the history of the French Revolution, and he came upon this argument between Volney and the ideologues and Bonaparte, and this certain German philosopher realized that the principles supported by these ideologues and Volney represented an absolute refutation of the specter of a theory. He was then trying to foist upon the entirety of Europe and indeed the modern world and indeed that certain German philosopher turned out to be Karl Marx. So Karl Marx picked up Bonaparte's pejorative related to the ideologues and it was Karl Marx that spread that pejorative meaning around the world and that's how today we use the word as that pejorative, the hard-headed iconoclastic activist who refuses to take on any kind of evidence which refutes their little pet theory that meaning of the word ideologue that's coming from the throat of napoleon bonaparte spread around the world by karl marx and it's uh worth mentioning that uh, karl marx took a crucial element of ideology that is of the of the uh, of the ideology of the ideologues which was their idea of uh a class warfare between those close to state power and abusing that for their own good and versus everybody else. So sure. they had, they had a theory, uh, they had a theory, they developed it during that time. It became the theory of industrialism. I think they called it or something. I can't pronounce the word exactly, but Augustine theory was a, was a famous example of a historian who took that idea and ran with it. But sure. their idea was that, well, it's in the ruins. It's right there in the ruins. It's the idea that uh, you can use the state to uh, get special advantages of the rest of society, and we mustn't do that, must we? I mean, that's that's the order. Exactly. There we are. Okay, anyway, yeah. but we should probably move back to uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Volney leaving America, and Thomas Jefferson starting to translate the ruins. So, yeah, so what's, what's going on is... Uh... Volney has gone back to France to do his little thing with Bonaparte there, and Jefferson is still vice president, but he's behind the scenes working to get himself best place to run in the presidential election of 1800. So he's busy doing things behind the scenes. It's really James Madison who's leading, quote, quote, that effort, but, but Jefferson is back there getting ready to run for president. At the same time he's doing that, he's finishing up Monticello and he starts translating Volney's Ruins. The, he gets to, there's 24 chapters in the book. Jefferson reaches the point of doing the entire political science section, which is like the first two thirds, chapters one through 20. And then he reaches the point point, says, look, the last part of the book is this thing about the General Assembly of Nations, where all the world's nations get together in kind of a first fictional meeting of the United Nations, and they argue about world religions. And it's there that Fulney presents the solution to the world's enduring religious conflicts. Jefferson said, I don't have time to do those last four chapters, 21 through 24. So what Jefferson did was he handed the manuscript to a person didn't put it in the mail, obviously. It was being sent overseas without his name on it, right? He was, he was maintaining a certain distance from this translation because he was afraid that if his name became associated with this translation, it would, it would uh, prevent him from being elected president because all of Jefferson's opponents, the Federalists principally, had always suspected that he was at heart an atheist. And if it was known that Jefferson was the guy who translated this Ruins book of that, that Volney cat who was here a few years ago that caused all that trouble and was spying for France, Jefferson would never have been elected president had it been known he was the guy who translated this book. So Jefferson insisted on anonymity. He put the manuscript on a boat in the hands of somebody, just a courier, 
and sent it over to France and said, you know, with a note saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do the last four chapters, the General Assembly of Nations chapters. You'll have to find somebody else. Well, Volney found another American, an American in Paris, a guy who was a poet and a land speculator, Joel Barlow. Joel Barlow translated the last four chapters. And happily enough, for Jefferson, Joel Barlow's name then became associated with the entire translation. It was a great cover-up, a great way. Everybody just assumed that this whole translation had been done by Barlow, and, and Jefferson was going, hey, cool, great. At some point, when you discovered Volney, you knew that Jefferson had translated that. How, how did that, that happen? 1923. A French researcher, a guy by the name of Gilbert Chinauer, is working at UVA in Charlottesville. And he comes across letters between Jefferson and Volney, which strongly imply, but do not specifically say, that Jefferson translated these first 20 chapters. So this, this French researcher publishes in the Johns Hopkins Press, 1923, his findings, these letters, and his interpretation of them, and nobody paid attention. The, the, this, the, the big irony of this whole thing is that Volney's ruins, the Jefferson, the unknown Jefferson translation, had a huge influence in 19th century America. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Walt Whitman, all these people were reading Volney's Ruins. It was, it was the big book that was read by all the abolitionists pre-Civil War. But nobody knew it was Jefferson. And now, every, well, in the 19th century, everybody was reading that. And now we know Jefferson translated, but nobody is reading Volney's Ruins. Even though it's, a, as I said in the very beginning, it's a book that has to do with it's timeless. It's about all epochs. It's about all cultures. It's about all countries, and so all centuries. And so, this whole this whole thing has been lost to history in a way, which kind of makes it. Uh, yeah, it's it's what not what Jefferson wanted. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It, uh, but it was influential in its day. It's just that. Yeah. A person like me, I don't think I knew about it until you approached me on library thing of all things. Yeah, was that how we got going? Okay, I was. That's, yeah, I was trying yeah. to remember that. Because I, yeah, I'm, yeah. because I, because I knew that this Duke de Tracy's, uh economics book was translated by Jefferson, and that's yes. and and I was an, I'm an enthusiast of de Tracy, uh so mm -hmm. that's that's why you contacted me, and then mm -hmm. I then I read the ruins. I uh, I don't think I'd known about it before, or if or if I had. You know, one encounters a lot of things in this planet and then forgets about them. And that, yeah, that's, sure. uh, almost certainly I'd heard about Volday, but, eh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, I, I'm i like, uh, I've got a history, political science double major from undergrad. I never crime, came across Volnay. Um I knew a bit about the French Revolution. I never came across Volnay. But you, you, you travel around Paris and you, you scratch beneath the surface on the you know, of the history books, and you go down at a level deeper, and that's where he is. Here in Paris, there's a Rue Volnay near the Opera. He's buried at Père Lachaise beneath a pyramid. Uh, if you go to uh, the fifth arrondissement, where the Pantheon is, where they bury all the heroes of the secular French Revolution, there's a, uh, a library right across the street from the Pantheon, where it has all the names of all the Western civilization of philosophers, beginning with the Greeks, beginning really, I guess, with the Egyptians, coming all the way through Greece and Rome, and then the European versions. Volney's name is up there, you know, and so he's he's here, he's present, and the strange thing is, it, you got to scratch beneath the surface. The, the French, they, they, oh yeah, I've heard the name, but they don't know what it means. They certainly don't know that ruins, empire's rise of government allows enlightened self-interest to flourish was meant to be a refutation of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's work, principally the social contract. Now, 
there's no French people alive today that really know that. So, uh, you know, what we've got here is an example of a hero of the French Revolution refuting the very basis of the French social model as it exists today. The moral foundations of the French social model were refuted by a, a hero of the French Revolution two centuries ago. And that is probably the reason why nobody knows in France really who Volney was. The people who know who, who know him best are booksellers. Okay, very good. That makes sense. Yeah. And you collected quite a few books of Volney, is that correct? Yeah, well, I, 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 uh, when I learned all this, um, I was still researching that novel, English Turn, uh, and um, I started, I realized that nobody understood what I understood. I realized that there was, this book was once world famous and it was really popular in the US. And so I started buying up editions of Jefferson, of Jefferson's translation. First edition, Paris, 1802. Second edition, Paris, 1817. First US edition, New York, 1828. I just looked on Amazon. They've got an 1828 for sale right now for $950. By the way, if any of your any of your watchers, listeners want to uh, read Ruins, they can get a Kindle edition on Amazon. I just checked it out today. It is the Jefferson translation for about a dollar and some cents. Or you can go to Gutenberg.org and get it for free. Download it for free. Electronic. So that's... Very good. I must say that the Gutenberg edition is a little confusing because it has quite a, it has several different in versions of the invocation, and uh, and it talks. It has many. It has a lot of prefacing material, which I found. Yes. I actually found more confusing than helpful. <laughs> yeah, they. I, I think they did that in some of the in some of the nineteen. Actually, what that that Gutenberg edition is actually from one of the nineteenth century editions from the mid nineteenth century, eighteen fifty or so, okay. and. The publisher at that time was saying, here's an example, here are three different examples of uh, the invocation. It gives you a taste for these different English language translations. And this is why Jeff Jefferson and Volney wanted to translate, because this American English that was more modern at the time, it, it's probably, you know, it sounds a little bit old to modern ears today, right? But at the time, it was the leading edge of American simple English. And so that's that's why they had those three different examples of the invocation, just to give you a flavor of what each, the differences between each one. Uh, which one is the Jefferson translation? If anyone wants to know, you can go to Amazon, click on any of the editions for sale, and you will see my reviews that I have put on Amazon which say this edition is or is not the Jefferson Barlow translation. And at the bottom of each of those reviews, I, I spent like weeks at one point, I think it was like 2012, 2013, going back and just hitting every single edition that was on Amazon at that time. And you still see those reviews. At the bottom of those reviews, uh, there's five general rules about how to recognize a Jefferson translation. So if any of your watcher listeners want to uh, go to Amazon, click on one of my reviews, it'll say Thomas Christian Williams, and um, you'll know that that's me and that I wrote that. And at the bottom of that review, you'll see those five general rules to determine whether or not they're looking at a Jefferson translation. What I did was I finally, I amassed the world's largest collection of Jefferson translations over about a 10 year period. And uh, when I was in the US last, I donated the best part of that collection to the research facility at Monticello. Very nice, very nice. And they were happy about that, I assume. Yeah, they were They were very happy. They, they, they realized uh, what this means um, in the past, the past 10, 15 years, everybody's been on this Sally Hemings thing about Jefferson had this relationship with one of his slave women and had children with, and that's, that's great. You know, that, that's an interesting bit of Jeffersonian history. I'm saying this thing about 
Jefferson translating Volney's ruins is the next big thing in Jefferson studies. And they realized that at Monticello too. And that's why they were so happy. So there is now a Thomas Christian Williams collection of Jefferson translations at the research facility at Monticello. But you contributed something to this. Like you said, there was this 1923 uh, bit of scholarship. Uh, oh, the, right, right, yes. But that yes, was not so conclusive. You that was con- not conclusive. You conclusively proved that Jefferson translated it, correct? What I, I, I was doing my own research, and what I found were um, manuscripts in Jefferson's hand of Volney's ruins, which is the proof positive. Yeah, there's the biggest part of that is at the Massachusetts Historical Society. You can see it online, and they finally agreed with me. They did not know what this thing was, and I talked to them for a while, and they they did their own research, and they said, yeah, you're right about this. This is important. So you can go to Massachusetts Historical Society. I think it's mhs.org, and uh, look at the Jefferson Manuscripts of Volney's ruins. There's also a microfilm of the same thing at UVA. They did not know what it was. And then there's also another microfilm, or is it, I'm not sure if it's the original, uh, the original manuscript at the, um, the National Archives in Washington, D.C. in the, I think it's the Madison Building, where they keep all the oldest stuff. They did not know what this thing was, and I inform them. So now when you go to the National Archives site and you click on Volney, it says this is Jefferson's handwritten translation of Volney's ruins. It positively identifies it. So that was my own personal contribution. And another thing is that the very first editions of Volney's, Jefferson's translation, Paris 1802, Paris 1817, they came in two volumes. But you look at the book and it's only a book about this big, so there's no reason to put it into two volumes. And it just turns out that volume one is chapter is the invocation, chapter one through 20, which exactly Jefferson did. And the second volume is chapters 21 through 24, which is what Joel Barlow did. So by putting them in two different volumes, even though it was totally unnecessary, the book's not that big. You don't have to make it into two volumes. Volney was slyly recognizing the work of two separate translators. So that's another little addition that I've added. That's very interesting. But it would also be useful for the person at the time to hand the first volume to somebody so as not to freak them out. Yes. It is. Yeah, that, 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 that General Assembly of Nations is where all the world's nations come together and they all give their version of what is the true word of God and they get into a big fight. Nothing is settled. Everybody camps on their position. And it's in that position, at that point, where a philosopher comes on stage and presents the solution to the world's enduring religious conflicts. We're almost to the end of our little uh, episode, I think. But I, I did want to get that clear to everybody, that you actually have determined. It's your scholarship that determined that Jefferson translated Volney. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, the people at Monticello want me to write a book. They want me to do a scholarly article. And, you know, I'm, I've written my novel, English Turn, right. at Amazon. And I've written, I've written a t- another novel that I'm trying to get published right now, a totally separate subject. So I'm pretty busy. You know, I've got my, my own life. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm at the point of saying, academics, do your work. You know, get on the stick with this. And that's that, you know, if somebody offered me money to do it, okay, I I might interrupt my life, you know. But otherwise, I'm just like, I've I've published an article in uh, Skeptic Magazine on this. That's the only publishing I've done other than my own novel. So if you want to learn about this in English, if you want to learn about Volney in English, it's all there in the novel. Um, and then we'll just have to see what the future holds for myself and the rest of humanity. Well, that certainly is, uh, that certainly is an open question at that point. <laughs> I have, uh, there are three things I think I wanted to bring up. Uh, one of them is The Ruins is an odd book by modern standards. 
that is people don't write books like the ruins right right um, right it's, it, it's not quite political science but it's not quite a novel either it reminds me a little bit of uh nietzsche's zarathustra book but also sparked Zarathustra, where he has a, where he has his madmen's and prophets and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of, yeah. it, it's kind of flowery like that in, in that sense. It's, it's an attempt to do that. But this yeah. is much more, this is much more classical French than Nietzschean. Did you ever contemplate or think about the Khazar question when you considered that last section of the book? No, which question? The Khazar question. Khazar question. The Khazars were a, an empire for a short period of time that were a buffer between European Christendom uh, and uh, Islam. And the, they were a pagan outfit and uh, they had a dual, uh, they had a dual kingship, uh, a military king and a uh, domestic king, you might say, the Kagan yeah. and the Beck. And the Kagan decided that they needed to adopt one of the world's major religions. So he invited the, he invited Jewish scholars Muslim scholars and Christian scholars to present the best case for each of the three religions. And uh, being a canny individual, uh, this Kagan, the Kagan, uh, decided that they would become Jews. And so there was a Jewish empire uh, in, well, I don't remember what period it is, around late 800s, 900s, 1000s, around there, uh, in the, near the Caspian Sea, Black Sea region. Okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Stalin had uh, the, the one really good site that had the, uh, had, ruins of the of the of the uh, Khazar empire was flooded in a major dam effort way, a long time ago so so the it's it's been an interesting question and so every time i read the volney's last section i think of this is his update of the Khazar question and uh, yeah. and i think that's kind of interesting and i'm reading a book right now about uh, the importance of genghis khan in the development of the idea of religious liberty which i was uh, separation of church and state uh, which I had no clue about. Uh, that, that would not be my first thought when I hear the words Jing, Genghis Khan. That would not, okay, separation of church and state. Yeah, of course. Just... Well, it turns out that that was his policy everywhere he went. But he also had, a, one, one of his excuses for conquering people was, well, it's he would deal with the religious leaders of the area and says, well, you're obviously doing this wrong because otherwise I wouldn't be here conquering you. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there, there's a better book written about the uh, about Genghis Khan and uh, religious liberty, which I'm only begun begun reading. So, uh, no. but it is interesting that it has it. It's interesting to see various different and radically different strains of thought converge and reconverge over time, and uh, that's just one of them. I just it, it, it struck me. Uh, well, looking again at what you've. Uh, accomplished and also looking at your book which i for some reason i don't read kindle very often it's the it's the one uh platform i don't read very much of so i didn't ever finish your novel so i started reading it again so i'm i i hope to finish that very well, soon. buy a hard copy and i'll sign it for you sometime do you have hard copies for sale yeah yeah sure there's kindle there's a kindle version and a hard copy oh i will, I will do that then people should go to amazon.com looking for the english turn English turn. Uh, is there, I forget which is there an article at the beginning. Uh, English turn. Napoleon invades Louisiana. Okay, it's a great idea. It's a great idea, and uh, and the opening chapter is magnificent. So, so people should go there. Thank you. And buy the book. And uh, we should talk again soon. We're at uh, fifty minutes or so. So I think that we've uh, done our duty to our audience, and I hope that people understand that this was a. We're dealing here with a book that was really important for all of the 19th century in America, but also in France, and now is not known, and it has something to do with limited government. And that's important for my readers and my listeners, yep. because I'm, you cool. know, I'm a local foco, and that's what we're all about. Uh, you're right on it. It's a, it's a Whig-inspired book. And that was the reason Jefferson was interested in it. Volney's Ruins, lost classic in Western literature. Well, thank you, Thomas Christian Williams, for uh, helping us out with that. Timothy, thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Local Focal Netcast. I think I'm going to call this episode Thomas Jefferson's Ruins, because it's his translation of Volney's Ruins, which has been our main theme. Thomas Christian Williams has written a book, as he mentioned, and as we talked about several times, called English Turn. That's available on Amazon. And in the course of our conversation, I mentioned a book that I'm reading right now, whose title I should cite. It's Genghis Khan and the Quest for God by Jack Weatherford. And uh, 
Perhaps after I get done reading it, I will report back. Maybe I should even talk to Mr. Weatherford. It's a very interesting book. And I didn't mention to Christian that Thomas Jefferson was an enthusiast of a history that was written of Genghis Khan at that time. So this is not out of left field. It does play into the theme of this podcast. But this podcast really should be concluded, right? We're, we're done. We're done here, right? And my name is Timothy Verkula. You can find me at workman.com. That's workman with an I, not an O. And on social media, my handle is usually at workman. That's workman with an I, not an O. This has been the Locofoco Netcast. You can find us at locofoco.net. Thank you.